This is a presentation of the Center for Advanced Study at the University of Illinois. For over 50 years, the Center for Advanced Study has brought together scholars from diverse disciplines and backgrounds, encouraging and rewarding excellence in all areas of academic inquiry at Illinois, one of the nation's premier public universities. For more information about this presentation and other center activities, please visit cas.illinois.edu. Good afternoon. I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker, George Andrews, who is Evan Pugh Professor of Mathematics at Pennsylvania State University. Andrews was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 1997 and the National Academy of Sciences in 2003. He has just completed a two-year term as president of the American Mathematical Society. And as a teacher, he has been recognized on several occasions. George Andrews is generally recognized as the world's leading expert in the theory of partitions, for which he will give a brief introduction in today's lecture, highlighting the contributions of Ramanujan. In 1976, in the library at Trinity College, Cambridge, he discovered Ramanujan's lost notebook which he will also discuss in this lecture. Indeed, this afternoon, George Andrews will speak on the meaning of Ramanujan and his lost notebook. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you all for coming. I generally like to thank all the sponsors of a talk like this, but I counted 17 of them, so I, that would require I'd leave out a certain portion of my talk if I did all that. But nonetheless, I am grateful to all everyone involved. There is such a wide range of organizations and departments involved. It is a great honor to be here to uh, give the, this Miller Lecture. As Bruce mentioned in his introduction, I have just finished being president of the American Mathematical Society. Uh, it is a great honor, of course, to lead the nation's largest association of mathematicians. Uh, it requires lots of flying, which is not much fun anymore, and a variety of committee meetings and other responsibilities. But there's one thing that makes it absolutely worthwhile. If you are the president of the American Mathematical Society, they're the graphic arts department of the society, will produce for you your presidential symbol. And what you see on the screen there is my presidential symbol. Uh, so what is involved th then is the, a picture where you see in the background an Indian skyline of an Indian city, just barely visible, the bright Indian sun, and the presence of Ramanujan uh, looking out from the heavens. And the formula that you see highlighted on the screen is uh, parameterized by the integer k. When k is equal to 1, this reduces to the assertion that 1 equals 1. When k equals 2, it is one of the most famous formulas that Ramanujan found. And the, when k is larger than 2, it is a formula that I found shortly before I got involved with the Lost Notebook. So this, in some sense, encapsulates 
uh, things related to my life and, uh, and is a, an appropriate symbol, not just for the president of the AMS, but a symbol to, uh, to undertake today's talk. So the first thing I want to do is to tell you more about Ramanujan. This is a picture of Ramanujan that is much more, uh, is basically the same image as the one you saw uh, emerging from the Indian skyline. So Ramanujan is a hero in India. Uh, he is indeed has been had a stamp issued in his honor on his 75th, what would have been his 75th birthday. So what I want to do before anything else is to tell you just a little bit about Ramanujan and, uh, and what a surprising career and a surprising set of contributions that he made to mathematics. After that, I will introduce several topics that uh, vary from sort of mathematical to tangential to mathematics or, or at least related to mathematics with regard to mathematics education and uh, perhaps finish up with a few lighter things such as Ramanujan and the Tribeca Film Festival and, uh, and other, uh, uh, other things of that nature. So let me start out with the story of Ramanujan's life. Ramanujan was born in 1887 in a small town in southern India, grew up in the small city of Kumbakonam. He was mathematically gifted as a child. He, um, when he went to high school, you can visit the high school in Kumbakonam and you will see certificates that he won because of his uh, mathematical skill. His mathematics really took hold of him. He was sufficiently talented that he, all, he was born into a poor Brahmin family so that while they were of the upper caste, they had very little money. And so in order for him to go to college, he needed a scholarship and his achievements in high school were such that he was able to get a scholarship. However, his first year and his only year in college at the government school in Kumbakonam did not work out so well. Uh, he did continue to do well in mathematics, but uh, some of his other subjects he either neglected or something went wrong with them. In any event, his grades overall were sufficiently poor that he lost his scholarship, and because he was poor, he had to leave the, uh, leave the college. Uh, G.H. Hardy, his subsequent benefactor and mentor, writes of him as follows in this period of time, Ramanujan does not seem to have had any definite occupation except mathematics until 1912. In 1909 he married and it became necessary for him to have some regular employment, but he had great difficulty in finding any because of his unfortunate college career. About 1910, he began to find more influential Indian friends, but all their efforts to find a tolerable position for him failed, and in 1912, he became a clerk in the office of the Port Trust of Madras. This, of course, sounds like uh, a sort of standard tragic story of someone who, because of unfortunate circumstances was not able to achieve what he might have in life. However, Ramanujan was someone who more or less seemed to ignore most of the things around him in concentrating on mathematics. He wrote extensive notebooks before uh, at this period of time and indeed my dear friend who introduced me, Professor Berndt, has devoted five volumes to explaining and understanding the mathematics that is in these notebooks that Ramanujan wrote at the time that he was, at the time and before when he was working at the Madras Port Trust. Many of his friends 
uh, encouraged him to write to some English mathematicians in order to uh, gain uh, favor of, uh, and help from, uh, from them. And uh, he actually wrote to three mathematicians. The first two uh, rather brushed him off. I will say a little later why early in my life I felt great uh, disdain for the two who brushed him off. Uh, subsequent events have caused me to at least feel some, uh, if not exactly sympathy, at least understanding of how they might have responded. Fortunately for Ma Ramanujan, however, the third person he wrote to was the person I just quoted, G. H. Hardy. He wrote as follows, Dear Sir, I beg to introduce myself to you as a clerk in the accounts department of the Port Trust Office at Madras on a salary of only 20 pounds a year. I am now about 23 years of age. I have had no university education, but I have undergone the ordinary school course. After leaving school, I have been employing the spare time at my disposal to work at mathematics. I have not trodden through the conventional regular course, which is followed in a university course, but I am striking out a new path for myself. I have made a special investigation of divergent series in general, and the results I get are termed by the local mathematicians as startling. I would request you to go through the enclosed papers. Being poor, if you are convinced that there is anything of value, I would like to have my theorems published. I have not given the actual investigations nor the expressions that I get, but I have indicated the lines upon which I proceed. Being inexperienced, I would very highly value any advice you give me, requesting to be excused for the trouble I give you. I remain, dear sir, yours truly, S. Ramanujan. And with this letter, he sent along a number of formulas, and in, in amongst them were these two formulas. There were also uh, a variety of assertions, uh, some definite integrals, a, a real varied collection of mathematical results. Uh, fortunately, I think in these formulas one finds some definite integrals that Hardy himself had actually been working on and had been sufficiently proud of them that he published this so that when seeing these same integrals in Ramanujan's letter, Hardy immediately realized that here was a mathematician of exquisite taste. <laughs> in addition, there were formulas here which absolutely stunned Hardy, and the two you see on the screen are examples. Hardy says of these, I had never seen anything the least like them before. A single look at them is enough to show that they could only be written down by a mathematician of the highest class. They must be true, because if they were not true, no one would have had the imagination to invent them. <laughs> Finally, the writer must be completely honest because great mathematicians are commoner than thieves or humbugs of such incredible skill. So, Hardy then went to work to arrange for Ramanujan to come to England to work on mathematics. There were a variety of obstacles involved with this, difficulties with Ramanujan, his family, uh, questions about the Hindu religion and traveling overseas, but eventually all these were overcome, and Ramanujan came to England in 1914 for several years of an absolutely astounding collaboration. Uh, I would say that a significant part of number theory, especially analytic number theory in the 20th century and into the 21st century, was heavily influenced by the, the ideas and the methods that were pioneered by Ramanujan and in his collaboration with G.H. Hardy. I will show you something about what's called the partition function in a moment, but I should say that his work on the partition function with Hardy was the precursor of what is called the circle method in analytic number theory and uh, has played a huge role in the discoveries of number theory in the 20th century. The work on probabilistic number theory, which has also played a significant, had a significant 
bit of activity throughout the 20th century has its origins in one of the papers that Hardy and Ramanujan wrote. The, the amazing achievements uh, with regard to the theory of modular forms and their applications in number theory, although Ramanujan certainly was not the one to have discovered modular forms, he nonetheless had an insight in them and an, an understanding of questions related to them that truly shaped uh, a number of studies and achievements in the 20th century. So that this period of time, these four years between 1914 and 1918, more or less, were an absolutely amazing uh, achievement. In 1918, he contracted an illness and there is great debate about what the illness was. It was thought at the time to be tuberculosis, a variety of people uh, speaking 70, 80, 90 years later say that it was uh, some other form of uh, illness, perhaps uh, related to problems with amoebas, perhaps a vitamin deficiency, perhaps a variety of things. Of course, doing a post-mortem 75 years or more after somebody's dead always leaves a little doubt as to what the problem was. And nonetheless, the fact was that he was very ill and convalesced in England for uh, a year. Uh, during that time, he became sufficiently uh, depressed that he actually tried to commit suicide by throwing himself in front of a train, and it was an only an alert brakeman who was able to prevent the, his death from occurring. So he had a difficult time, but in 1919, presumably he got a little better, and it was decided that maybe if he would return to India, he would, uh, he would do much better. Unfortunately, when he returned to India, he, he died within a year. We do not know exactly uh, all the things that he was doing in India, and indeed for most of the 20th century, the only thing we know about his life in India was that in January in 1920, three months before he died, he wrote a letter to G. H. Hardy in which he said nothing about his health, so there was no indication that he was ill. He was only talking about mathematics. Indeed, he starts out by saying, I've discovered some very interesting functions recently, which I call mock theta functions. And unlike Professor Rogers' false theta functions, they enter into mathematics as beautifully as the ordinary theta functions. And with this letter, I'm sending you some exa examples. And again, there were several pages of mathematics, mostly formulas, no proofs. The, the, the original notebooks that Ramanujan had written that Bruce has so eloquently developed, there are no proofs there, and there were no proofs in this letter. Um, we know a little bit more about what his life was like from an interview with his widow who said of his last year, he returned from England only to die, as the saying goes. He lived for less than a year. Throughout this period, I lived with him without break. He was only skin and bones. He often complained of severe pain. In spite of it, he was always busy doing his mathematics. That evidently helped him to forget the pain. I used to gather the sheets of paper which he filled up. I would also give the slate whenever he asked for it. He was uniformly kind to me. In his conversation, he was full of wit and humor. Even while mortally ill, he used to crack jokes. One day he confided in me that he might not live beyond 35 and asked me to meet the event with courage and fortitude. He was well looked after by his friends. He often used to repeat his gratitude to all those who had helped him in his life. So we know that indeed, instead of somebody who was just dying, he was uh, using mathematics to forget the pain. And so what one wonders what all was there in the way of mathematics that he was doing at this period of time. So now I have to interweave my own story into this. 
When I was a graduate student at the University of Pennsylvania, my thesis advisor was the famous analytic number theorist Hans Rademacher, who himself had been fascinated by this last letter that Hardy had written to Ramanujan and that Hardy had actually included in the collected papers of Ramanujan, which consists of all the published papers of Ramanujan from this four-year period and before that Ramanujan had actually put in print, either joint or individually. The last two pages of the volume have in it this, the mathematics from this last letter. And, and Rademacher thought this was very interesting, and so he suggested to me that I might study these mock theta functions, as they're called, and at least try to improve upon the work that one of his other graduate students had done 15 years earlier. And so I sat down to study and work on the mock theta functions and became, for a number of years, well, I could say the world's leading expert on mock theta functions, but actually I was the only person on earth who knew anything about them at all. Uh, so in 1976, I was on leave at the University of Wisconsin as the guest of Richard Askey. And in the spring of that year, there was a conference to be held in Strasbourg, France, to last for a week, and I was invited to that conference, and I very much wanted to attend. However, fortunately for me, the then irrational pricing policy of the airlines worked as follows. If you flew to Europe and stayed for three weeks or more, the cost of your ticket was epsilon. And if you stayed for less than three weeks, the cost of your ticket was one over epsilon. <laughs> This meant that there was a tremendous incentive to spend another two weeks in Europe if you could basically justify being there as, as, as academically appropriate. And so I uh, tried to think up things I could do that would be academically appropriate. And one of the things I knew was that the late G.N. Watson had papers from his estate that had been contributed to the Trinity College Library and Watson, <coughs> excuse me, Watson early in his career, in the 1930s, was very interested in the work of Ramanujan and indeed studied the notebooks that Bruce has, has uh, finally brought into this full uh, five volume uh, account. So, and, and Watson wrote a number of papers on this. So I thought that his papers might be of interest. So that was one of the things I proposed to do. So I walked into the Trinity College Library and asked them to bring out the boxes of Watson's papers, which they did. And in one of the boxes were things related to Ramanujan. There was a, the actual last letter that Ramanujan had written that I have just discussed that is is set in type at the end of his collected papers. So that letter is there. In addition to that, there were 100 pages, some written on both sides, so about 140 or so pages, of Ramanujan type formulas, very similar to the notebooks that, uh, that uh, Bruce had dealt with, the notebooks that Ramanujan had written before going to uh, England. So, what, what's the origin of these? Where did they fit? Well, uh, the thing about them is that, let me show you a page. So some pages are totally chaotic. Other pages sort of look like this. So in particular, there are no proofs. And this is one of the wordier pages in the Lost Notebook. I mean, you can see the word order over in the left-hand column. And there is change right there, and to and in. And there are a few other things like that. But most pages have no writing on them at all. In particular, the, the phrase mock theta function appears nowhere in this volume. However, I knew all about the mock theta functions, and there they were in this, in this manuscript. They weren't named, but there were the mock theta functions, which of necessity meant then that this manuscript was 
contained many of the discoveries and results that Ramanujan had found in this last year of his life. And uh, so that was what I would call a, an exciting moment, let me put it that way. Um, so in particular, so you might say, well, perhaps somebody had discovered all the things he discovered. Quite the contrary, there are many things there that had been rediscovered, many times with great fanfare and, and appropriate applause, but one of the most amazing things to me was the following. When Watson was writing in the 1930s about Ramanujan, he wrote two papers on the Mach theta functions. His first paper is related to the first set of Mach theta functions, which, which Ramanujan called third order functions. And he was quite pleased with how he developed them. Watson was quite pleased with how he was able to understand them. His second paper he's obviously much less happy about because he cannot do the things that he did with the first paper because there are certain missing formulas that would set up transformation formulas that would explain everything about what it's called the fifth order Mach theta functions. And indeed, in the introduction to his second paper, he alludes to the fact that he is very doubtful that such formulas as this exist that would allow the construction of the theory of the fifth order functions to the same level as those of the third order. In the lost notebook, one can see if you are aware of how this is constructed, that Ramanujan had not only everything that Watson found, but also the formulas that Watson conjectured did not exist, which meant that this, this study could be carried on extensively beyond where, uh, where anyone had seen, uh, and in particular, way beyond what uh, way beyond what Watson had seen. So it was clear there were discoveries here that had lain there without, uh, without anybody tumbling to their significance. After I uh, had uh, worked on this for several years, I wrote to J.M. Whitaker, who with Robert Rankin were the two people who, who, were, who managed to get these papers into the Trinity College Library, and Whitaker wrote back to me as follows. When the Royal Society asked me to write G. N. Watson's obituary memoir, I wrote to his widow to ask if I could examine his papers. She kindly invited me to lunch, and afterwards, his son took me upstairs to see them. They covered the floor to a fair, of a fair-sized room to a depth of about a foot, all jumbled together and were to be incinerated in a few days. One could only make lucky dips, and as Watson never threw any way, anything away, the result might be a sheet of mathematics, but more probably a receipted bill or a draft of his income tax return for 1923. <laughs> By an extraordinary stroke of luck, one of my dips brought up the Ramanujan material, which Hardy must have passed on to him when he proposed to edit the earlier notebooks. So the, the, this notebook came within a hair's breadth of uh, being burned in the flames of, of the, from the estate of G.N. Watson, but fortunately, especially fortunately for me, it was not. So this is the story of Ramanujan, and this is the story at least of how I got sort of heavily involved in thinking about Ramanujan. And so what I'd like to do next is to try in what I conceive of as a very general lecture to a very general audience so that not everyone in the audience has a PhD in mathematics. I want to give you just some feeling for some of the surprise of Ramanujan's mathematics. And one of the things that I think has the most surprise is cited in this, let's see, is that, can everybody see that? Yes. So this is a footnote uh, just uh, whoops, taken from the, the, uh, the, actually this footnote appears in the fourth volume of the World of Mathematics that is this famous uh, collection of mathematical essays. 
it says, it, it is quoting from the obituary of G.H. Hardy. One of the joint papers of Hardy and Ramanujan is worth noting briefly. Denote by P of n the number of ways of denoting a positive integer n as the sum of integers. For example, five can be expressed as one plus one plus one plus one, and he lists all the ways you can add integers up to get five, and if you count those sums, you will see that the total number of them is seven, so we write P of five equals seven. Some of you may think that he's failed to get some relevant sums. So for example, two plus two plus one is not listed there. So when you talk about the partitions of a number, you are, you are only talking about what actual summands occur, not the order of the summands, so that one plus two plus two is to be considered the same partition as two plus two plus one. So with that caveat that we don't we don't take notice of order. There are seven partitions of five. It is plain that P of n increases rapidly with n, and P of 200 equals this number 3.9 trillion, which in talks I gave many years ago, I used to refer to as larger than the national debt. <laughs> uh, but time marches on. Uh, and, in parentheses, he says, as was shown in a computation which took a month. Hardy and Ramanujan's achievement was to establish an explicit formula for P of n, of which the leading term is the one that you see on the screen. And to anyone who comes at this with a modicum of mathematical knowledge, this is a truly jolting formula because what are we actually counting? What are we doing? We're doing the simplest process of arithmetic, namely addition, and all we're asking is, how many ways can you add up numbers to get a given number? And, and the answer is that for an arbitrary n, you have formulas where the first term looks like this, and as is remarked below, five terms of the formula give the correct value for p of 200. Everything about this is, seems to be uh, jarring upon first glance. What in the world does pi, the ratio of the circumference of a circle to its diameter, have to do in this expression? Those of you who are purists may be uh, somewhat worried about the fact that I'm differentiating with respect to an integer variable. So calm down, this is just succinct notation. Uh, one differentiates with respect to a continuous variable, and then you set the continuous variable equal to n. So there's no real problem there. The, the, the re remark that p of 200 is this, if we actually calculate the terms of this series that Hardy and Ramanujan have, this is the calculation as they list it. They've actually carried out, I think, eight terms here. But you see that the bulk of this number, 3.9 trillion, is all in this first term. The next term is very small in comparison, and they very quickly become exceedingly small. And when you add up this column of numbers, what you get is this 3.9, et cetera, out to 388.004. So why is this an exact formula? It's an exact formula because what Hardy and Ramanujan prove is that eventually, uh, the size of the error becomes smaller than one half. And so if the size of the error is smaller than one half, all you need to do is round up whatever you have to the nearest integer, and that will then necessarily give you the right answer as the number of partitions of n. And so there you see this calculation carried out. This was a great surprise, uh, partly I think because it can be viewed as the fundamental problem of, of addition, whereas the fundamental problem of multiplication can be viewed as what's called the prime number theorem, which has a very uh, 
uh, the best one can get there is a very approximate answer to how many prime numbers are there smaller than a given bound. And thus, one might have expected, and indeed Hardy did expect, that the formula they would get would be only more or less within the ballpark of the right answer. Ramanujan, on the other hand, was convinced throughout that they would get an exact formula, and uh, he proved to be correct. So, what sorts of things are in the lost notebook? Let me just give you a, a the tiniest sort of hint. Uh, I don't want to spend a long time on the lost notebook, but because I want to to move on to the to non-mathematical aspects of Ramanujan's life, I. So I've just chosen one set of formulas which seem to me to illustrate the sort of thing that is disturbing to both outsiders and insiders about Ramanujan. So here are some formulas or some series that are written at the top of one page in Ramanujan's notebook. This is my handwriting. I've made, blown things up so you can see them, but I've tried to copy exactly what is on that page. Now, these formulas are all look rather similar. They have similar ways of, of, each term looks very much like the previous one, although in each case there is a difference in each line from one to the next. So maybe they do have some relationship to one another. And indeed, it turns out that they do have a relationship to one another. Namely, the first line, if you expand it as a power series in this variable q, it has a very simple expansion. Namely, the famous triangular numbers are the exponents on the variable. And if you call that function f of q, the most unexpected thing in the world happens. The second line is exactly the same as the first line, but you replace q by q squared. So that if you replace q by q squared throughout, you move from line one to line two. There is not the least indication at all that that is true on the left-hand side. That is completely hidden on the left-hand side. And if you move down, the third line is f of q cubed. And the fourth line is f of q to the fourth. Now you're taking an intelligence test. The last line is wrong. <laughs> It's f of q to the sixth. And this is the sort of thing that is, it permeates this lost notebook, these sorts of surprises where unreasonable things like this occur. To an insider, that's what I consider myself, there are even grittier surprises because when you look at this, if you know the sorts of things I know, you think, well, I can handle these very quickly. And you start out on the first one. The first one took me, I would say, probably 10 minutes to do. Lines two and four took me probably something like half an hour. Lines three and five took me months. And yet they seem like they all ought to be equally difficult. And yet that turned out not, now that may be a measure of the fact that I'm just dumb, but it, it is the sort of thing that happens over and over in looking at Ramanujan's work. seem to have scrambled my notes here, so uh, I wanted to move on to a comp the contribution of um, Edward Schills in discussing uh, the universality of truth. So I'm going to relate this. I, I think I will start out by just quoting Schills as to what he has uh, has said. So Schills wrote, the late Edward Schills, who was a sociologist at the University of Chicago, let's see here if I can 
wrote an article entitled Reflections on Tradition, Center and Periphery and the Universal Validity of Science, the Significance of the Life of S. Ramanujan. And so what he is suggesting is that, that one gains from this change the, that mathematics as an example of universality of truth is something that transcends cultures, transcends races, transcends uh, all the things that may be viewed as separating human beings. From thinking about Ramanujan, I have concluded that there are no territorial or social or religious or ethnic limitations on the validity of what a scientist discovers. The discoveries of a scientist of one civilization or nationality can be received, assessed, and assimilated by scientists of any other civilization or nationality, assuming, of course, that the recipient scientist is sufficiently informed regarding the state of the subject and has the intelligence and scientific training to comprehend what is offered to him. The mathematics which Ramanujan did in India could be assessed by British mathematicians of the highest order to the extent that they could retrace the steps which his intuitive powers had enabled him to leap over. It was not the Indianness of Ramanujan's mathematics which baffled the first British mathematicians, Hobson and Baker, whom he approached. It was their excep exceptionally advanced originality. It required two mathematicians of, the, of very high quality, Hardy and Littlewood, to appreciate, to learn from, and to contribute to Ramanujan's work. As the years passed and his notebooks have been studied, his mathematics have been interpreted, proved, and assimilated by West, Western mathematicians. I have not read any references to the specifically Indian character of Ramanujan's mathematics. His mathematics are mathematics indifferently of the place and the circumstances of their creation. The intimate reciprocal relationship between genius and tradition are evident in the case of Ramanujan. He made a connection with some older and incomplete condensations of the tradition of mathematics developed in Europe. He retraced in his own way and in ignorance of them paths of the tradition which had already been traversed in Europe. In other respects, he shot well ahead of the points reached by the movement of the tradition in Europe. It is unlikely that the tradition of Hindu belief in which Ramanujan participated steadfastly obstructed his advances from the tradition of mathematics which had developed in Europe. Ramanujan thought that the Hindu goddess in whom he believed had in fact inspired his mathematical advances. So the thing that, that concerns me and I think concerns many of us in the university are real questions about whether or not uh, how culturally tied down mathematics is and what sorts of responses we should make to that. Um, there are in evidence in the world of education explicit statements by people who are uh, highly placed and, and knowledgeable that this is, that Differences in culture truly do affect both mathematics and how it should be taught and what should go on. And uh, I can quote briefly from uh, 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 the woman Peggy McIntosh, who is uh, the director of the SEED project, um, Seeking Educational Equity and Diversity. Uh, in a democratic and racially diverse society, to concentrate on arithmetic skills is, is bound to demoralize children of color who, she suggests, are culturally not disposed to the notion of getting ahead. She, th she describes a young black girl from Roxbury working on a math worksheet which requires her to add single digit numbers such as five plus two plus six. The child, however, did not grasp the mathematics and got all the answers wrong. She was trying to get these problems right. The alternative was to get them wrong. So this is a situation within the win-lose world in which there's no way the child can feel good about the assignment. This aspect of, of believing that there are certain groups who can't do mathematics or that they can't do the standard mathematics has uh, 
has taken root in other serious ways. There, are, there is a movement uh, which I learned about being on the Committee on Science Policy of the AMS uh, to replace in any university that has a remedial algebra course I think almost all of us are aware, at least I won't speak for the University of Illinois, maybe you're tremendously successful at remedial algebra at Penn State. We are not tremendously successful at remedial algebra. Many of the students who need remedial algebra find that it is a trial and the success rate is not all that good. There is a proposal being funded by the Carnegie Foundation and being put forward by Yuri Treisman from the University of Texas at Austin to replace remedial algebra with a statistics course in which a few algebraic facts will be uh, introduced as, as is made necessary and that this may be the solution to our problems. In other words, there are people who can't do algebra the new president of the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics, has his inaugural address refers to what he calls endless algebra, where students take algebra over and over and over again, and his solution to this is that we should instead have students take statistics. There is a video on the web by Art Benjamin from Harvey Mudd College, which recommends strongly that we not make algebra the core of what goes on in high school, but instead teach students statistics. So I won't dwell on that. I'll be happy to respond to questions on that during the question and answer session. But I want to get to just a couple of other things. So the next thing I want to talk about is the Tribeca Film Festival. So seldom when you're a mathematician do you actually wind up as somebody participating in a major film festival. Uh, but to my delight, I, uh, I got involved. So uh, three years ago, I guess, the, the Sloan Foundation uh, was supporting at one of the events at the Tribeca Film Festival. This is a film festival that takes place in the area, Tribeca area of lower Manhattan. And um, th this event was to be the following. A man named David Freeman had written a film script of the life of Ramanujan entitled A First Class Man. And what was proposed to happen was that nine actors and actresses were going to read a short portion of the script, and then there would be a panel discussion of what actually went on. So we were sent the script, so it's, it has a number of accuracies in it. I think it's a well-written script. Uh, it turns out that there is a young woman, a sort of bohemian painter named Esme, who at one stage in the script suggests to Ramanujan that she paint him in the nude. So, uh, anyway, so <laughs> two or three weeks before the, the festival, I was actually giving a series of lectures at Lehigh University and was out to dinner with my hosts when my cell phone, which I've carefully shut off uh, for this lecture, my cell phone went off and so it was my friend Krishna Lodi from Florida who was to be on the panel along with David Freeman, me, and the panel would be uh, moderated by Ira Flatow of NPR. So Eladi has now seen the script and he's seen Esme's proposal to Ramanujan and he is beside himself. The Indian community will never accept this. This will, everything will blow up. It will be terrible. I, so I said, calm down. Uh, this is, this is he, doesn't, he doesn't agree to be painted in the nude. And so this is just sort of a, a, an editorial flourish by the author. So we get to the Tribeca Film Festival. We're sitting there commenting on things. And so each of it, Eladi is going to comment about uh, Esme and her uh, painting uh, suggestion. I, on the other hand, am going to comment on the following, namely, the first part of the movie focuses on this discovery of this formula that would produce the number of partitions of 200 to an exact value at 3.9 trillion, the exact value I showed you. 
How did they check the answer? How did they know the answer? Well, the truth is that they asked the uh, P.A. McMahon, who was very good at calculation, to use some recurrences that date back to Euler that would allow you to actually compute this in a few hundred computations. So it's a very, uh, uh, it's a, it's high-level mathematics used to do this computation. Those of you who have access to computer algebra packages, these same sort of algorithms are there if the partition function is in your computer algebra packages, and they go like that. But in 1914 and 15, uh, computa this computation, as Titchmarsh observed in this obituary, took about a month. So how is this going to be presented in a movie? After all, it's not really very cinematic to have McMahon sitting at his desk calculating using the pentagonal number theorem. So the David Freeman has the following idea. He'll have McMahon hire an army of undergraduates, and together they will write out the four trillion partitions <laughs> of 200. <laughs> So I pointed out that suppose you had an army of 100 undergraduates and each of them could do one of these sums a second, then, and assuming that they did not take any breaks to go to the bathroom or eat or sleep, at the end of a year, one of them would have done something over 30 million uh, of these if he'd done one a second. And if there were 100 undergraduates, they together would have done something around a 3 billion. And so in a mere 1,000 years, the, <laughs> this, this very pers perspicacious group of undergraduates would have, assuming they made no mistakes. So, uh, so it was nice of David Freeman to sit there while the audience uh, chuckled as you have chuckled over this story, and he allowed us how that maybe this was overdoing suspension of disbelief. <laughs> However, he, he stuck to his guns on Esme and saying, well, he was a young man in England and, you know, this is life and so on, and he was going to stick with it. So. Obviously, the Sloan Foundation, uh, hoping not to get some sort of moralistic advisor, uh, as a lot appeared, appeared to be, asked me to uh, be the advisor to the film script. So now I get the entire script. So, so it wasn't just that she suggested to paint him in the nude. By the time we get a little farther in the script, she's in bed with him. <laughs> Okay, so uh, that rather bothered me. Um, so, um, let's see if I can actually put my glasses back together so that I can read the small print of this. This is going to look great on the videotape, but I can't <laughs> help it. I, I wrote to the author and said, <clears throat> I remember once sitting at dinner next to a professor of music, music history, shortly after the film Amadeus appeared. His discomfort uh, after re uh, reminds me somewhat of my own discomfort after reading your play. There are two matters which bother me greatly. Let me begin with the one that bothers me least. I'm troubled by the fact that Ramanujan appears to be someone who gains his mathematical achievements effortlessly. I acknowledge that he did pray to Namagiri, and he did tell friends that she gave him formulas in his sleep. However, the picture both painted by his wife in the NOVA program, The Man Who Loved Numbers, and by examination of the numerous pages of numerical and algebraic calculation which fill many pages of lost notebook, makes clear that an immense amount of concentration and energy were devoted to his researches. It all comes across as much too easy in the play, especially early on. The second issue is Esme. I grant that Ramanujan's relationship with Esme provides the buildup of guilt leading to the actual suicide attempt. As a device for making the script hang together, this would appear to be an essential element. However, I also know that Esme is pure fiction. There is no evidence to my knowledge that there is anyone remotely resembling Esme who played a role in Ramanujan's life. While Esme is important to the plot, she also turns Ramanujan into an adulterer. 
For a mathematician who values faithful monogamy above mathematics, this is enough to turn me against the entire project. If this were a wholly fictional play, I would have no difficulty with it. The world has seen its share of philandering mathematicians, but this is supposed to reflect, quote, and I'm quoting him, the generally accepted version of events depicted, unquote. Countless mathematics students will see this movie and they will come away from a compelling human drama which they will regard as history. Indeed, near the end of the play, you have Ramanujan say, that is the thing about art. If it is any good, it becomes the truth. Unquote. I do think this is a good script. This movie will thus become the truth, even though it is in important ways quite false. So a, it is an interesting question of what, what really are the bounds in terms of presenting a fictional historical account, account of real people. Uh, Amadeus is the movie I was referring to where the music professor was concerned about s distortions of what Salieri really was like. And uh, of course, there is The Beautiful Mind, which a movie in which John Nash saw visions, but in real life, John Nash heard voices. He did not see people who were not there. So questions like this are ones that are worthy of discussion, and I will leave those to the, the question and answer period. I do want, as so can I have just a little bit more? I do want to conclude with something from the NOVA program, which was the man who loved numbers. And so I, about a minute of the script, it is going to tell the story of the number 1729 and Ramanujan's uh, relationship to that. So if I could have the videotape and I could shut this off, which will ruin the videotape. So this is... No one can understand Ramanujan who does not understand his passion for numbers in themselves. He could remember the idiosyncrasies of numbers in an almost uncanny way. It was Littlewood who said that every positive integer was one of Ramanujan's friends. I remember going to see him when he was lying ill in Putney. I had ridden in taxicab number 1729 and remarked that the number seemed to me rather a dull one and that I hoped it was not an unfavorable omen. No, he replied, it is a very interesting number. It is the smallest number expressible as a sum of two cubes in two different ways. So that's, that's, this is World War I, so, that, so. Okay, terrific, now everybody who's asleep will not be embarrassed. Okay, great. Uh, <laughs> So, so let me tell you about the making of this. Uh, so uh, earlier in the, in, the, in the film, I was interviewed. So they made this movie for Channel 4 in England, and it was called, in, in, in England, it was called Letters from an Indian Clerk. They hoped, however, to sell it to Nova, but selling to Nova a story about an Indian who grows up in poverty in India, then goes to school in England and goes back to India, does not have what they call the American connection. And so they needed an American connection, and here I am. <laughs> so so uh, I was going to a conference in Germany and when they, while they were filming this, so I stopped in London to be involved in the filming, and so there is a fairly extensive interview in this. However, I was actually in the scene that you just saw, and I will tell you about that. Namely, um, they had found the cab driver who currently had the cab 1729, so the cab that you saw there is the current cab in, 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 Brit in London that has cab number 1729. Of course, when they told the cab driver that they wanted to employ him for an afternoon in the suburbs of London because his cab number was the smallest integer that could be written, <laughs> uh, he did not believe them and it would only agree to do this when they wrote to him on company stationery, but eventually he agreed. So I was 
I had finished my interview, I was going to Germany the next day and they were going to do this in the afternoon, so I asked if I could tag along just to see how they shot something like this. So this is several hours of filming to get that uh, particular uh, sequence that lasts a minute. The first thing they noticed once they got everything set up is that they had nobody to sit in the back seat as G.H. Hardy. Everybody had a job except me. So, <laughs> so my role in that part of the movie is to be the ghost of G.H. Hardy. So uh, you can't, certainly can't make it out that it's me, but there is somebody in the back seat. Anyway, the first thing you do is to see the cab coming down the street and turning into uh, to the street where Ramanujan was, was convalescing. So this took take after take after take. A kid would run out in the street or somebody would make a left turn in front of the cab and it, it took forever. We kept driving down that street and pulling up there. Finally, we got a perfect take and so now I'm to get out and as you saw, the eyes of G.H. Hardy, through the eyes of G.H. Hardy, you're walking up to the door of the place where Ramanujan is convalescing. So the cameraman now gets back in the back seat and gets out of the, of the cab to go up to the door. And as he gets out of the cab, he bumps his arm on the door because the door will only open up perpendicular to the cab and is held in place by two massive Phillips head screws on a, on a cord like that. So they call the cab driver over and say, we have to take this door off so the cameraman won't bump his arm when he walks up to the door. And so the the, the cab driver goes over to his toolkit and the biggest Phillips head screwdriver he had was about that size. It sort of fit the, the things in the Phillips head screw were about that big. And so he couldn't close to do it. So now everything shuts down and all the crew goes over to the, to the TV van to try to find a Phillips head screwdriver and nothing is going to happen until this door is taken off. So only the director and I are standing there. Everybody else is busy searching for a screwdriver. So I turned to the director and I said, look, down there, about half a block away, you see there's an automobile repair agency. Why don't you send somebody down there and you could borrow a Phillips head screwdriver, you might get this off. And he turned, looked at me, he said, now I understand why you're a professor. <laughs> And, and with that, I would like to thank you all for your attention. I have enjoyed this, and I am very grateful for your coming out to hear this story. Thank you. So, uh, I, obviously, those of you who have to leave, please feel free to do so, but I wanted to take uh, the question and answer period. So. Uh, there will be microphones available. There is, this lady has a microphone over here and somebody raised his hand over there. So why don't we sort of move across if we could and uh, make sure that... Uh, I have a loud voice. Oh, you have a loud voice, okay. Well, the, the, the story, the 1729 story, is, or it must be apocryphal because the number 1729 has many other interesting properties. How many of those subtle and interesting properties So I, I, I certainly believe it is true. Uh, I think actually Hardy tells it, does he not? Yes, so, so uh, anytime I'm worried about the factualness of my statements, I turn to Bruce, who knows all about it. It is also the case that in the notebooks that Bruce has edited, he has a number of facts about various numbers. I think it was Hardy who said all, all the natural numbers are his personal friends, certainly this fact is in the early notebooks of Ramanujan. Uh, the fact that it is interesting in countless ways, whether how much was known before that, I, I suspect strongly that that particular fact was known to others. Uh, probably that's true, yes. I have a nod that it's true. Uh, but so, so I, the only, I, what's obvious, I guess, is that Hardy knew none of this and so was surprised by it. Uh, it was, I think, a measure of Hardy's inability with small talk because it seems a strange way to, 
uh, he, the way he pre presented it was, I came here to get a, in cab 1729. It is not a, seems to me to be a rather dull number. I hope this is not a bad omen. So there, that's the way to, to greet a sick friend. Uh, <laughs> hate to miss the video. <laughs> I'm, I'm one of these uh, just ordinary people from the community. Yes. I have a feeling there's lots of mathematical minds surrounding me. Uh, it seems like Ramanujan's mind, mathematical mind, uh, may have worked somewhat differently or was different than, quote, the ordinary mathematical uh, way of looking, at, way of processing. Could you kind of talk about how he might have, uh, his brain might have worked? So I'm always, so, I, so you'll be happy to know that even in purely mathematical audiences, I'm asked often the same question, and I don't have really a very interesting answer. I'm very reluctant to speculate on how he did things, uh, even at times when I, think that I have seen something, there will something else will come up to make me think maybe this isn't the way he saw it. So, so I, I really, after spending the bulk of my adult life studying his mathematics, I cannot say that I have any real feeling for how he did things. Obviously he had insights beyond those of anybody else whose work I've studied. That is quite clear just from the things that he wrote down. But I do not know what they are. Uh, especially when I'm speaking to purely Indian audiences, there will often be suggestions from the audience that, that the, what is responsible for his mathematics was uh, the Vedas, his Hindu religion, vegetarianism, a variety of other uh, suggestions like that. And my response to that is always the same. Uh, we must take our hats off to India for India is way ahead of the rest of the world in producing Ramanujans. You have produced one, and the rest of the world have produced zero. So, <laughs> so, so while you are way ahead, you have not produced enough for us to do any sort of serious scientific evaluation of what actually, actually produces such people. So. I, I'd, I doubt that, but it certainly was different in some, some amazing sense. Uh, I will give you at least one speculation, and that is that his wife, in being interviewed, says of him that he was so concentrated on his mathematics and writing on his slate that we had to roll rice balls up and put them into his hand so he could eat without looking up from his slate. So it might be that perhaps there was a sort of hyper ability to concentrate and to apply oneself in ways that many of us do not possess. I don't know. I, I don't really want to say that that explains anything. It's just that there are all sorts of possibilities as to why he produced such magnificent things. I was actually going to ask if you actually agree with Scheele, or you have some quibbles. No, I have no quibbles with that. You have no, no, I, no with I, that. I believe that that I believe that mathematics is universal. So, so I would I would agree with that to an extent, but I would agree I would also disagree that Ramanujan is the example that speaks to that because he grew up very much in an English medium tradition. He went to a school. He learned, as you can see from his initial letter, he grew up very much in an English educational context. Uh, so, well, yes, I, 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 yes, I, I think that's a fair statement. One can argue with, with whether Shields has really a, a sterling example there. On the other hand, uh, it is the case that he did grow up while, while there was the, the material from the European tradition, he also certainly grew up in a heavily Indian Hindu tradition and that had a tremendous effect on him but did not the goddess Namagiri whispered good mathematics to him, and it was universally valid. 
Right, but I mean, we all come up with explanations of how we come up with proofs, and that was his. And I'm not, you know, his, that's his explanation of it. I'm, I'm just saying that I don't think it's the best example to pick of saying that, oh, it's, I think Scheel romanticizes him in a way that's not necessarily uh, correct. Um, anyway, that, that would be my quibble okay. with Scheel. Okay, well, so. uh, perhaps not unreasonable. Uh, what can you tell us about the uh, people who ignored Ramanujan's letter, letters to England? Well, so that, so one of the things that he sent to either, was it Hobson or Baker? I forget, anyway, he sent along the formula 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 plus 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 equals minus a twelfth. <laughs> okay. So what he's writing down is the value of the Riemann zeta function at minus one. In other words, this is his way of writing. There, so there is a significant mathematical fact that is there, but he chooses to write this in this way. Uh, there is a, is a play out that was shown at the International Congress last summer, that was presented at the International Congress last summer, called A Disappearing Number and has been shown at theaters uh, throughout the United States on, on simulcast in, in televised. And I, was, I tried to put it in the abstract for this uh, talk and would have talked more about it if it had gotten into the abstract, but it, the film was not shown here, so no one would have know, know about this play. But anyway, in this play, there is a there are parallel lives. There's the life of a, of a young couple in modern England, and then there's the life of Hardy and Ramanujan. And I can't tell you in a few words how it's woven together, but the beginning of the play, this young woman comes out and on a blackboard establishes why Ramanujan would have written that, and all the mathematics she writes is correct. So that she puts down the functional equation, the Riemann zeta function, and it is amazing that you can actually get away with that in a play that has that has been reviewed well in London. So, uh, so, but anyway, I will say I do forgive Baker and Hobson after I appeared on the Nova program. Almost every mathematical psychotic in North America wrote to me, more or less with the same idea that if I had somehow gotten ahead in life by, by uh, uh, trading on the achievements of this fairly pedestrian Indian, think how much farther ahead I could get if I discovered them. So, uh, <laughs> so anyway, that I was wondering if, um, given the hero that has been made out of Ramanujam, uh, was he always right? Um, was he had, always right? Yeah, were there flaws? Were there ever flaws in his notebooks, in in formulae that he wrote down? So, thank you. So he was certainly was almost always right. I I would say that in the lost notebook, which is where I've looked at it, it carefully, uh, Bruce could talk about the earlier notebooks. I think I've found one or two typos where he clearly wrote or, or left out a factor or an exponent that obviously he, he just wrote down incorrectly. There are other places where he writes a formula and then, but he doesn't write all that many terms and he puts dot, dot, dot. And if you write down what you think he meant, it's false but you have to write down what you think he meant, okay? Uh, I cannot remember one from the Lost Notebook that is explicitly uh, just wrong. Maybe Bruce could correct me on that. Bruce shaking his head. I don't want to remember one that's explicitly wrong. Uh, so I do, there are one or two that are misleading in the way I described, but, but that's only because I did the obvious thing, and Ramanujan somehow saw it differently. Yes? Uh, it's interesting that uh, even after he worked with Harding, he did not really, uh, it seems, uh, try to give proofs for his um, uh, theorems. And I'm just wondering whether there, you know, 
could be some, some people have suggested there may be some hidden connection. The traditional Indian mathematics, which had some very, very great insights, also operated without offering proofs. And I wonder whether there could be some kind of tradition that he uh, uh, drew from in addition to the European input which he had. Well, the story, at least as Hardy tells it, that seems to convince Hardy of why he did things that way, is that he was influenced by Carr's, toch Carr's coaching notes for the mathematical tripos, where there's this book of mathematical formulas and theorems without proofs, and that definitely Ramanujan had access to it, and maybe this influenced him. That's a possibility. It is also possible that some of these formulas he didn't know how to prove. When Hardy questioned him about what are called the rogers ramanujan identities, he wrote back with a number of empirical uh, arguments as to empirically why these should be true, but confessed that he did not have a proof. So even before he went to England, he very clearly understood what a proof was. In the lost notebook, one does not find proofs. On the other hand, Paper was always expensive for him. You can see that in various uh, snippets of conversation that are recreated by his friends as to his life there. And so he wrote many things on a slate. So we don't know what he wrote on the slate. Uh, it may be that things that we take a great deal of effort to prove, he saw that he could write down the proof, but it would not interest him that much. Uh, I have no idea. I do know that, that he wrote, it's hard to write down that many things and not make any mistakes, but, uh, but what, what he really knew about these formulas, we will, as far as I know, we will never know. Yes. What if p, what if in the function, in the function, in the p function, what if it is, an, what, if, what if it's zero, a negative, or decimal? What is it, zero, negative, or decimal? So, uh, so basically, Ramanujan would look at functions rather than specific numbers. The, the example that I chose where I was talking about the number p of n, the number of partitions of n, so there were specific numbers involved there, and they are all tied up with one of the classical theta functions that really goes back to Euler. So it was the sort of mathematics in the background surrounding numbers like the number of partitions of n that, that Ramanujan was looking at, and the theta functions are, so to speak, in the background the same way understanding p of n would have a function in the background. I don't know if I can say more than that. <laughs> Do we have one more question? There's no question that Ramanujan was a remarkable mathematician, but there have been other remarkable mathematicians like Euler and Gauss and whatever. Mm -hmm. In what way is Ramanujan remarkable in a different way from the ones in the Western tradition? So Ramanujan, I would say much less than the mainly the famous ones that you described, was not someone who, who developed full theories of things. So when we think of Jacobi, we think of his fundamental nova and the full development of theta functions. Uh, certainly, Euler uh, uh, contributed immensely to what, the advance of analysis from a nascent subject to one uh, stretching over a variety of things from differential equations to, to uh, uh, various, a variety of applications. Uh, Ramana, none, not, Ramanujan's mathematics is, is very much of this uh, one formula after another, which makes him different from these people. The fact, though, that, uh, so that, and, and that suggests somehow that I see him at a lower level, but that is 
What I see, say, with regard, for example, to the Mach theta functions is that he was able to see into an area that was completely unexplored at his lifetime and for most of the 20th century thereafter, but has a massive and impressive superstructure connected with it that no one would have thought to create if it were not for the fact that he saw enough going on in this area which he recorded in these formulas that allowed uh, others to, to create the theory. So in that way, he's quite different. Uh, I, I'm not at all suggesting that he's uh, smarter than uh, Newton. If I had to say who was the greatest mathematician in history, I think I would say Archimedes. But, uh, but uh, in terms of what one would call great mathematicians, that was the way in which he was different from others, at least that's my take on how he was different.